Hey everybody, before we get into this episode, a little bit of context. In this episode, it's gonna be a little different. My friend Greg Gardner interviewed me about Building Thinkers, a little bit of the context and story behind Building Thinkers, what we're trying to do, what I'm learning, and I recorded this episode several months back and perfectionism has gotten in the way of actually publishing it. I keep overthinking that now, you know, I have different language, I have more clarity than I did then. So this is my attempt to squash the perfectionism and share what I believe Building Thinkers is currently doing. And, you know, since then I have clarified some language and I've been sitting with this, the fact that I've dedicated my career to really unleashing human potential through learning experiences that are full of joy and rooted in science. And so Building Thinkers is about doing just that, unleashing human potential, and and primarily at this current moment in time in the education space, in the technology space, and what I'm describing as companies working on human flourishing. And so that looks different at different times, and I'm becoming okay with that, that the projects may look different, the opportunities may look different, what unifies it is this desire to leverage the knowledge, the experience, the creativity that I thrive on, that I'm rooted in, and apply it to make things better (laughs) At, at the most simple level, because I do believe there is this potential. And I often think about the Todd Rose quote in End of Average, human potential is nowhere near as limited as the systems we put in place assume. So whether that is directly in our education systems or in companies or ed tech companies that support education that are aiming to do that, what are these opportunities to where the people that are involved, all of that human potential in small companies, in large companies, what things are holding it back? Why are people not doing the things we want them to do? Or why are we not making the progress we want to make? And so I love being involved with people that are after those big audacious goals that can support human flourishing. So That's what I've got, and that's what Building Thinkers is about. And so as I try to not over-edit my interview, Greg interviewing me and sharing some of those thoughts, I want to share some of the story behind it. So thank you, and without any further ado, here's my episode with me and Greg Garner. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast. Today, we get to do a fun episode. I'm joined by my friend, Greg Garner, and we're gonna do a little bit of a reverse interview to explain a little bit more of the backstory of Building Thinkers, and um, Greg's gonna help me just articulate that and kind of talk through what we're trying to do um, with Building Thinkers, what I'm up to, and all that stuff. So thanks, Greg. Yeah, I just like that I get to (laughs) turn the tables, and instead of, just talking about me, which is really boring. Um, I'm gonna interview you, and so this episode is gonna be about building thinkers, like the brand, the idea, um, how you got here. Um, I know it's been a long road with a ton of twists and turns, and for some reason, you keep asking my opinion on things, and so now I want everyone to hear from you. What is building thinkers? What will it be? And then I really am curious and and want everybody else to know, who is Tracy Clark and what is your core purpose? (laughs) Oh, easy questions like that. So (laughs) this is uh, why I reached out to you and I knew, you know, you wouldn't let me off the hook easily um, with any simple questions. And you would also, you know, challenge my own assumptions and help in many of our conversations. I feel like you help me articulate back what I'm actually trying to say sometimes. Uh, and we will circle back on your very not boring work in another episode here shortly. Um, but I think, you know, as I was thinking about this really easy question of who, are, who am I, <laughs> I kept thinking about, um, you know, really the most centered idea I got to was that I'm a learner. And in particular, I, uh, I've been obsessed with learning for a long time. And uh, I think that 
what I find is important is creating a resilient growth process. So essentially uh, the learning cycle of going from realizing that there's some desire or a gap or need to know something and going from that, almost imagining it as a cycle, like I see a gap or a desire and I wanna learn something to help me to do that thing that I can't yet do or that I want to do or I wanna solve. Sometimes it starts as a problem, but some sort of gap learning and then not getting stuck in the learning, but then applying that learning. Um, and so I think I'm somebody who's a learner and I'm driven to, for impact, um, to help others learn and apply that learning. I think about learning as an expo exponential um, process. And so I imagine helping learners like learning with an exponent at the top because it shouldn't stop there. Um, and whether it was my own students in my former classroom or um, supporting teachers or supporting district leaders or working on statewide initiatives. I think that it's the same heart of wanting to build something that outlives me, um, something that can actually, you know, kind of make the dent in the universe, in particular um, in education. I unapologetically want to change education. <laughs> and I think in the last couple of years, I've kind of rewritten that core statement to, I, I think that there's more to be done more broadly around learning. I want to use design to get at, you know, some of the sticky problems within learning itself so that we can get to that, not just survive and not just transactional relationships, but thrive and, um, see humans as, as the full of who they are uh, in, in learning environments. And so, um, you know, I love the Todd Rose end of average quote that human potential is nowhere near as limited as the systems we put in place assume. Of course, I see that in education. And then as I have, uh, you know, looked at what learning looks like beyond the specific K-12 education um, space that I have primarily been in, I see the same things. I see applying the learning that I've spent a lot of the last 15 years really digging into. I see the application um, in other spaces. And I think it's interesting. We've talked before about how, you know, different industries, you know, it, you see this in the, in the conference space, right? When we were going to kind of ed tech conferences, we couldn't really understand why certain practices that were happening there were not happening in CNI conferences, curriculum and instruction conferences, and vice versa. It was weird to us that there was like these microcosms, and that's just an education space, right? And then I've recognized that that's everywhere, right? Um, and so the ideas that we can apply from one space to another, there's so much value in that. So I think that that's part of my kind of obsession with learning is to continue to improve whatever it is I'm working on, which usually is in the learning space somewhere from other industries and taking those concepts and applying them. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so that's a bit about that. One of the things that you <laughs> said that I, I wanna drill into a little bit more and then I'm gonna hold you to the core purpose answer. Um, so <laughs> you talked about wanting to change education and I, I will fully and readily admit, if anyone else is like me, they are super jaded and super tired of people coming in to change education. Like we have this kind of cult, sociocultural understanding that education is fundamentally broken, uh, or at least that's what we've been told that we're supposed to believe. And so one of the things that I've noticed over and over and over again is everyone has this crusade to change education, but it's always essentially about kind of pimping their own product and their their idea for how they're going to change education is because you have to buy their thing that they have mm. created. Their app is going to be the savior of education um, or their model, their system. and. That's never been any interaction that I've had with you is that one thing is going to totally save education. And so I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear a little bit more. When you say that you want to change education, you might be one of the first and, dare I say, few, maybe only, that have a much more <laughs> holistic approach to this idea of mm -hmm. changing education and really infusing learning into a variety of interactions. Mm -hmm. 
So talk, talk to me a little bit about this. Like, what is when you say cha change education, how are you doing that? Mm. That's such a good question. I think that when I first felt that instinct and that you know even language came to mind, which does it when I say like it, it's not new language change education, but I felt it as a calling. I felt it as something that I heard that this is something I'm supposed to do, right? And so I literally laughed when I heard that like desire because I was like at that time um, in the classroom um, as a bilingual fourth grade teacher thinking how am I at 20, I graduated college early, 20, like gonna do that. Um, I was getting my master's in early childhood focused on special ed. Um, I had spent time teaching in the public schools of Mexico by that point. And what I saw, what actually drew me into switching career paths from originally I was going to do um, bilingual speech pathology. Then I went and had this experience in Mexico teaching in the public schools um, and with students with special needs. And I came back and I decided to get my education master's in early childhood. So that shift was because I saw an opportunity to support learners in, in that time with both uh, differences in, in um, with special needs and then also language learners. And I was thinking um, that I saw an opportunity to, you know, in a, in a small way to me, change education in that moment for my students. So getting much more narrow into what does it look like? Maybe it's not the make a dent in the universe, Steve Jobs, piece but how can I like what's coming to me is the starfish story the really cheesy starfish story of like it made a difference for that one like can you make a difference in the world but you know you know what I'm talking about okay so absolutely throwing the starfish back in the ocean that's what it was in my classroom so I felt like I saw the light turn on for my bilingual students um by things I was doing in the classroom that I didn't really have a name for at that time but ended up being a personalized approach to instruction where I got many times my campus leader could not find where I was because I wasn't at the front of the room I was down on the ground with my students like building things and he couldn't tell what subject I was in I was a self-contained bilingual teacher at that time and so he didn't know if I was teaching like which block of instruction I was in because I was kind of in all of them um, and I so I think when I think about changing education at that time, it was for those learners doing something in a different way um, that I actually didn't even realize was a different way. But it's about whatever environments I'm in, whatever at this point clients I get to work with that are, in my opinion, making an impact in education um, across our state and in their districts and with campus leaders, I have seen the true change of impact and the the role that I really enjoy playing within that is in thinking about the specific learning activities that help somebody shift a mindset. So for example, we know so much about how kids learn and it's one of those areas, much like many other areas, education is not the only one, where research and practice have a very large gap for a variety of reasons we can get into another time. But what I like to do is take those amazing, really nerdy, really enjoyable to me, 50 page research papers from whoever, and synthesize them to three bullets that get, that get to the action of what does that actually mean for a campus leader? What does that actually mean for the CNI department, for my education clients? You know, and then, and then the, but that's not far enough right? Because many can do the summary, but I want to do the, the mindset shift that leads to the behavior shift. Maybe there's a better term for that, but like the, the thing that they do differently. So why should I do this thing differently? People are coming in, like, let's take a teacher. Like people are coming in all the time telling me to do stuff differently. I need people to stop telling me what to do differently and just let me teach, right? Yes. And there are some specific ways that we can teach to help kids learn. So until, you know, more of that is happening, I think there's always work to be done there um, to change education in individual classrooms. But even more so, it's not about like this top down approach of getting like, I just want the teacher to do what I'm telling them to do. But it is helping a teacher to understand why there's value in any shift, because I wouldn't want to tell a teacher to shift anything that isn't aligned 
to a practice that, that I believe that research will support will help more of our learners have more um, equitable learning opportunities. So at the heart of, of my current desire for education is I wanna see learning like work for all learners. And I don't think that that is that impossible of a goal. I do think it is a long marathon and, and, and there are moments of bright spots of initiatives or opportunities that really have done some of that and and yet i think that in the in the world we live there will always continue to be really big roadblocks to having it be you know this like i don't know what the right term is like maybe like panacea or something like some magic opportunity where suddenly we have an equitable school system um you know that then creates an equitable workforce that then creates you know i don't know but but i think it's worth anything we can do to help like back to my starfish to help each of the starfish whether that is an individual learner an individual teacher district corporate work system like the same things that i see in education and the same systems that hold back i see in corporate learning you know not taking each person as an individual kind of seriously not thinking about them holistically not thinking about so sometimes um, did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And so, I mean, as you were talking, um, what it made me think about is, you know, the, the narrative of your, your career, uh, what you're describing to me and what I'm hearing is you are bringing your full self into every interaction that you have. And that's something that is just really winsome. It's something that, um, has drawn me to you uh, repeatedly in the times that we've been able to collaborate uh, on different projects and that you're such an effective collaborator because you are so focused on, on making the uh, opportunity that is at hand as excellent as possible and that you bring, and again, you, you bring your, your whole self to it. And so it really feels that there's this arc of as you are faithful in the little things, more and more is being trusted to you. And so you are able to start in self-contained classrooms with a client of one, uh, you know, one individual child, uh, and then working your way to the point where you are being, you're able to run these, these pilots and build software and create uh, experiences. And you're able to work on these large, uh, you know, you know multi-district projects where now there are thousands of benefactors from mm -hmm. what you're creating. And, you know, I, I, I see building thinkers as, you know, I just think about this, the idea of the, you know, the overnight success story and the, the mythology mm -hmm. around that. Because there's this idea that, you know, someone is going to just be an overnight success, that they're somehow going to have one opportunity and they just got it right. That And that's not at all true that there has been you know two nearly two decades of work and effort and energy and and showing up and paying rent uh, you know daily to make it all work and you know I just think about so many of the the interactions that um, I, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of or have been fortunate enough to witness where you are responding directly to what's needed and you're not thinking about how does this solve a 50 year problem? You're saying this person right now needs this solved. How can I be a thoughtful, caring partner with them, collaborative partner with them to be able to address what it is that they need? And that's missing. I think that, that you know, if we wanna have conversations about uh, core purpose, if we wanna have conversations about how do we build thinkers, if we wanna have conversations about how do we, you know, quote unquote, change education, I think it starts there. And I think that's something that you have modeled so well. And so I think my question coming out of this would be, what about you makes that true? Why is it that you are the way you are? We can talk about you know, your, your Enneagram, if that helps to explain it, and how is it that you know, the, the personality traits that you have, are you, how are you leveraging them to, and bringing them together to do the work that you do? Hmm. Yeah. See, again, this is why I ask you. I need to ask questions like that. I think that, 
what's coming to me is actually I think a piece of it is creativity a desire for and some of this is just simply input I think the things that I read the experiences that I seek out I think some so for example right now I am doing a surface pattern design course with Bonnie Christine that is amazing so mm -hmm. surface pattern design is like these patterns and stuff like drawing these right so people amazing artists draw these in Adobe Illustrator and all sorts of stuff right and <laughs> that seems tangential to the work that I do however I'm doing that because I want to learn Adobe Illustrator with more depth to apply that to uh, many of the learning experiences that I am a part of designing because sometimes I feel constrained by the tools um, for for one of my main core clients we do most of our work in Google for its efficiency for its ease of use and to also show the the people that we work with like they can do this too because we want it to be very accessible so if it was you know a PDF from Adobe Illustrator that might be not accessible so my point in this is I think that I bring my whole self because I don't know how to not <laughs> I like it, it, it maybe there's just so much going on in my brain that I don't know how to be like multiple people I don't know how to how to not bring my passion and desire for change I'm an eternal optimist and so I as much as there are things going on right now that are deeply like th th that the only term I have for it is that I have to lament and that I have to deeply grieve things that are occurring and yet I see so much hope and opportunity to be really clear about the things that I want to be a part of changing to continue to push into my own relearning about my areas of bias, my areas um, of blind spots across insert any conversation that people are having right now that has controversy, like in any of those things. And so I think it's maybe it's my own like protection mechanism. So I'm at Enneagram three. And if you go deep into Enneagram, you can get into self preservation. I'm a self preservation Enneagram three. And so um, that. I love doing, I have endless to-do lists, I have endless ideas and notebooks, like all around me are notebooks and ideas and things like that. And once I get into hearing about a problem that I get any say in resolving, I can't stop. <laughs> and so it'll be marinating in the back of my mind when I'm running or, um, you know, and this is the area of parenthood that I have to do a lot of work in to be where my feet are when I am, when I, leave work and go to mom world to to really be there because sometimes I'm still thinking about my clients in the back of my mind and th I think that that connects me to another of my why I wrote this thing back in 2015 an open letter to my son's future teacher when Brady was um, a baby I don't know how old he was at that point like you know nine months old or something and what I wrote in that still very much resonates with a lot of my why too of the type of learning experience I want for him. So I bring my whole self because A, I don't know how to do it any other way and B, anything else feels inauthentic to, to, to who I am. Um, and I think maybe the third is, is this idea from Epstein of the, um, the generalist, like all of those experiences and things that I've had an opportunity to be a part of, I can see now from reflective work I've done how they help me to show up better into this current work. So for example, the, what I can now call directly infused learning work, <laughs> you know, um, the work on that app, uh, now directly impacts my understanding of user experience design. I would have never had that particular knowledge set had I not had the opportunity to work on that, you know, ultimately not successful company. And yet how much I learned, you know, from that. So what I'm That's hearing what is, <laughs> 
and so I'm going to push back a little bit first. Um, to say that a company is of not successful. Of course you are. Uh, yep. Um, but to say a company is not successful is usually a kind of determination as to, well, is the company still in business? Um, and the answer to that may be yes or no. And, and I would ultimately say that that doesn't really matter because the metrics of success, if your core purpose is to change education, is looking at the impact of what the software did. And knowing the ed tech space, the other software uh, companies that were in quote unquote competition with Infuse Learning, uh, they changed their products because of Infuse Learning. They changed what they had to offer because of the work that you did. They, they looked around and they realized that you were meeting needs that they weren't. And so if the, the success metric of a company is whether or not it continues in perpetuity, then sure, that's one way to measure success. But no company will last forever. And so in, ultimately, if the goal is core purpose, if the goal is rooted in principles and not in tactics, then measurements of success are ultimately about what difference did you make. And I, th I think it's, it's fair to say that even experiments like Infused Learning were phenomenally successful because of the difference that they made. And so I, I just want to take an opportunity to push back um, <laughs> because when we talk about success, um, I, I think that oftentimes we have the wrong measuring stick. And that's one of the things that as you're describing it, I think about this hierarchy of there's a lot of folks that think about tactics. They think about how to do things. Mm -hmm. And even from a, a coaching perspective, the coach, many coaches feel like their role is to teach new tactics. And then good coaches come in and they think about how can I give better strategy? And so they think about, oh, well, strategy will inform tactics. And then there's a lot of folks that have you know, nice business degrees, and I have a business degree, and um, they have these nice business degrees, <laughs> and they, they, they talk about the importance of strategy. And you know, the right strategy is, is what we need here. And so good coaches will, will come in, and they find the right tactics based on the right strategy. But what you're describing and what I have seen firsthand is that you as a person and building thinkers as, as an effort is not rooted in tactics or strategy, but in principles. And those principles don't change. And when something is rooted in principles, you have more freedom in the strategy that you use. And then you have unlimited possibility for the tactics that are available to you because ultimately it's about principles. And so what I want to know is what is it that you think people need to know? What is it that they get wrong all the time? How, you know, if, if we're talking about rooting in principles and we're talking about then being able to manipulate strategy and tactics, how then can we help folks to have a better grasp of the one thing that you need them to know? Hmm. So good. I think you just named, first of all, why I find it so hard to kind of explain exactly what I'm trying to do because I like to think about it's business on the outside, but purpose on the inside. Um, and so the purpose, the purpose that doesn't shift is really helping people have you know a meaningful learning experience, but that's not quite it either. It is an impactful learning experience, but it what isn't labeled yet is what that impact is because that's what's dependent on the client so somebody coming in thinking for example they have a, a learning problem you know most instructional design shops are going to say okay let's figure out the problem right so on and so forth sometimes it may actually not be a learning problem <laughs> It might be a larger culture problem, which then can come back to learning and things like that. Um, I think the strategic consulting experience that I have allows me to see some of that differently, maybe, than to see that the answer is always kind of to your point, the product that I can provide. Sometimes I might not be the right answer. Sometimes they may need um, that business coaching or you know something else that's different from what I'm really after. So I think that the the thing that one of the questions you had in there was 
what are things that people maybe get wrong and, and what are the things to really know? Well, I think one is that we shouldn't consider joy and fun learning as frivolous learning. I think sometimes in, in strategic consulting, we get kind of into this where it has to be kind of hard. And, and I, I can get into that. I do think sometimes it needs to be hard and productive struggle and all of that. But it doesn't need to be complex. And strategy doesn't need to be complex. It's essentially, um, you know, what is it that you're trying to do and then go do that. Like that, that's a strategy. Um, I was actually talking to Moss Pike about this, so this will be in a future episode. But um, anyway, we would talk through that idea of strategy. But I think that joy and play should be infused into our learning experiences. So I think that's one of the, I don't know if that's a core principle, but yeah, I think it is. I think core principles of the type of learning that I want to be a part of designing are rooted in research and best practice about how adults learn, kids learn, whoever the learner is. And those don't, those don't fundamentally change, although we do get more research to be able to clarify. And so I'm constantly looking at that to have more clarity about how I can, for example, reduce anxiety during a learning experience. I definitely didn't used to understand that. And now I, I much more understand how, and it makes so much sense, right? People can't learn if they're anxious or they're worried about, so how can we reduce anxiety in our learning experiences? I guarantee that's not thought about all that often, but it's important. So one is around the research, two is around joy and, and, and play being infused into the learning experience. I will always use the word infuse. <laughs> and then the third is this idea of learning ecosystems. I'm sure you're gonna push back on this word because it's jargony. But what I mean by that is, and this goes back to my surface pattern design experience recently, I am seeing in particular in well, I have seen it in online experiences, although I think it can be in online and face-to-face -face and hybrid and whatnot. You take the modality. But I think that there's a place for learning ecosystems, and by that I mean that learning is not an event, but an ongoing, living, breathing, cultural expectation. And in education, this is so clear because we have, you and I, have had discussions in the past around, you know, let's go back to like 2013 when there was, and, and still is, but at that time we saw a lot of this, like, I think you called it Siegel PD. You like come in, you do some stuff and you leave. Um, this kind of like just quick experiences. Um, and so we know that if there's exponential power in the learners themselves to learn and grow, then it's about turning on that like desire to learn and then giving them pathways and getting out of the way. And and so this idea that an expert has to come in and always deliver a like PowerPoint slide PD and, and then that'll count as your six hours of CPE credit, but the reading that you do on your own and sketch noting on a concept that's deeply meaningful to you doesn't count, like never made sense to me. So I, I don't know quite how to articulate it yet, but I think there is some work that I'm interested in around supporting people to develop learning ecosystems, which would be more of like a consulting project, I think, than an individual learning event type thing. But so that's where I get like, ooh, I wanna do that and I wanna do that. but. I do think there's something important about designing learning ecosystems because sometimes the answer may be you need a video. Sometimes you may need a learning manual. Sometimes you may need a Q&A on your website to solve the thing you think is a learning problem. You know, um, the, the thing that you think the solution to is a six hour experience could be a nicely crafted Q&A that somebody comes in and does research on what are the common questions and we, we do that. So. I think, again, that's where, you know, the, the type of learning that I find most engaging is the type of learning that I want to be a part of creating. And the type of learning I see is most engaging is full of joy and play and, and, and unapologetically because that is deep learning. And just because it like is fun doesn't mean it's fluffy and it's rooted in research and involves an ecosystem that usually involves some sort of community. 
the social aspect of learning. So in that surface pattern design course, there's a beautiful community of really supportive people, most of whom are pursuing a career that's totally different from what I'm doing. And yet anytime I post and share my, you know, like totally amateur work compared to what they're doing, they're so supportive and so interested in why I've kind of chosen to be there with them. Um, but it's so fun to even just watch that support. So I imagine like, what if we could have that in corporate learning environments? What if we could have that in our education environments where can you imagine like a superintendent of a district actually having another place to wrestle with safely, like not on the Twitters, but like safely wrestle with things that they're facing um, to move forward. And maybe there's places like that that are happening, but I just haven't really seen that. So, Again, I'm not sure if I'm answering any of your questions. Uh, well, hundred percent. I mean, so as you were talking, um, I immediately, you know, started jumping back in my brain to, um, uh, like Peter Singh's fifth discipline. And uh, I think it's the subtitle is um, the art and practice of a learning organization. And it talks about how, you know, as a business, you, you, you have to create learning as a discipline within your organization. That it, it is um, part of the culture of your business. Um, and then I'm, I'm reading another book right now that talks about, uh, I think it's called Prime to Perform, but it talks about um, you know, the, everyone has this idea of a career ladder as though there is one. And so it's talking about, you know, this idea that uh, we need to build organizations that are, um, uh, what's the phrase they use? It's the land of a thousand ladders, that you need to have a thousand ladders for people to be able to create their own path forward. And that doesn't happen unless you are actively engaged in learning and exploring and discovering and playing. And play is one of the primary motivators that's talked about in this in this book, Prime to Perform. And and I'm constantly thinking about ways to, to inject more play. Um, and that's I, I just I can't reemphasize what you've said any better or any more articulately than you have already stated it. And I just I hope everyone takes that to heart that play is a core purpose for all of us and that it needs to be something that we actively pursue. It's not something that just gets added on at some point in the future. We have to, you know, bake it in or infuse it at the, at the start. So Tracy, <laughs> I just dropped two books there. Um, I, I want to know what are some books, podcasts, courses, what, what else should, should people be checking out? Yeah. How do they get started? Yeah, I wasn't even sure if we would have time for all of that, but I, um, so I love all the John Acuff books. I am a John Acuff groupie. I've read all of his. And what's fascinating to me is that he has written them just for me. At the exact time in my life that I needed to read Start, I read that. At the last time I need, at the time I needed to read Finish, I read that. At the time I needed to read Do Over. I was literally restarting the type of work that I wanted to be doing at that time. I read Do Over. And now, um, I maybe have missed one of his, he has like seven, but um, now I'm reading, I just finished recently, maybe a month ago, Soundtracks, his guide to overcoming overthinking. I joined his Facebook open group. I did his challenge on overthinking. I sketch noted it like that. Um, so I think, the summary of that is John Acuff and all things John Acuff because he really I think he really does exhibit that play and humor and research that combination of um, just delightful books to read and these like witty little statements that stick with you so in um, overcoming overthinking in soundtracks several of the quotes that are up here, I'm looking up here because on my wall I have several of the quotes that came from that. But one is, it, it's like rewiring your brain to help you, you know, not overthink, which I do all the time. So one of them, the soundtracks that you rewrite is instead of like, I'm a mess or everything is out of order when I have lots of different thoughts and ideas, momentum is messy. Momentum is messy is a new soundtrack for me in this moment in time that I just started a podcast, I rebuilt a website, I, um, you know, insert, you know, kind of new things that I'm doing and learning right now, and it can feel very, very messy. Uh, however, momentum is messy, really helps me think about it in a different way. One more of the soundtracks that's helpful, this is just a podcast, this is just a blog post. So you actually use the word just before you do something, then after you do it, you're like, 
look at this podcast. You take off just afterwards, right? Because I, I used to have this whole presentation about you're not just a teacher. Take off the just. And it was like a motivating, inspirational speech. So it's funny to come back around and say, like, this is just a podcast. Like, five people will listen. It's fine. I don't know where to put my eyes. I'm going to put them wherever I want because that's the best conversation I can have. Um, so, Johnny Kef. Um the second one I think is also on your list, but that's fine. We'll repeat. The Art of the Gathering, Kriya Parker. I have to say this one because it, this totally, this impacted my work in a deep way that that nothing that I read has since maybe some, like when I got introduced to Jim Collins and a lot of the good to great stuff, that really profoundly impacted me at that time during Infuse Learning era because I just didn't know any of that. And, and Art of the Gathering hit me at a time when uh, the main client I was working with, I was leading a lot of the design around in-person gathering and it gave me such a thoughtful frame as I would sit down with the initial sketch of what we were trying to do to really start with the purpose in mind, so many of the things within there. But then the other thing that was interesting is how I then was able to apply when we needed to shift from um, you know in-person to online gathering to not lose our purpose, to not lose. So I applied it in new ways to what ended up being, you know, oh, it sounds so braggadocious to say it this way, but I'm going to anyway. Like, I think we created a transformative end-to-end -end online interactive learning experience. I don't use any of those terms lightly besides online, like it was online, but like it really, we created an, an interactive engaging experience. I wish there were other words for that, that, that more got to the core of what I'm trying to get at. But, but Priya Parker's book, I originally heard her on NPR and then bought the book immediately and it just made a big impact. So sorry to steal one of your books. You can still talk about it later. Um, and then I don't know what my third one would be because I have so many others. Um, let me think about that for a second. Well, uh, uh, maybe a recent one has been um, Adam Grant's uh, Rethink. Is that think what again? it's called? I think it's called Rethink. Think again. Adam Grant, Think Again, has helped me to give language uh, that I use often in areas where people are not always willing to rethink or bent towards rethinking to give some language to help people feel more comfortable with I'm not asking you to rethink your entire core values or whatnot I'm just saying in this conversation have you thought about it this way or what makes you say that you know so he's given me a lot of language and research to be able to navigate complex conversations in this moment in time <laughs> awesome those are fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm excited about uh, the. I have not read uh, soundtracks yet. It's on my list. I've got pretty much all of his other uh, Johnny Cuff's other books on my shelf. Um, funny anecdote to to kind of close this out. Um, so I live in Durham, North Carolina, and when we first moved here, we started going to uh, a church uh, that's based in uh, Chapel Hill, and the pastor is Mark A. Cuff, John's dad, and so. Uh, oh. We're going there for a while and didn't I, it took us a while to make that connection until he started sharing some stories and he kept talking about his son John and his son John is a writer and his son John and so eventually we were we pieced it together and then there was one time that John came to to visit and so Mark introduced me as John you've got to meet this guy he did do over before you wrote do over and I was like Mark please don't introduce me that way like, that's that's demeaning to John's work. John's work is way better than me just trying to wander through the wilderness of, of career growth. So that's um, that, that's your uh, John Acuff story of the day. Um, but Tracy, I, I, I really appreciate so you've this. Met him. I have, I have, um, and uh, he and and Jenny are both just wonderful humans, as you can imagine. Um, his his writing voice is the same as his in person voice. He's just a, a real person, which is awesome. Um, Tracy, I really appreciate you carving out time to talk about building thinkers. I know sometimes it can be uncomfortable to talk about yourself and to um, talk about things that you hold so dearly. And so I, I think that there was uh, a lot to, that folks can unpack and digest um, through what you've shared today. And so 
uh, where can folks connect with you? Obviously, they found your podcast, but where else should they go for all things Tracy Clark? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, where I'm most active publicly is uh, on LinkedIn. And so um, I'll put the link to that in the show notes. And um, also Twitter. I'm not quite as active as I might have been back in 2015, but I'm still... Um, would love to connect with folks there. I just don't expect like every five minutes for me to be tweeting there because I'm not doing that. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Um, and um, yeah, if you're interested in any of the instructional design work, any of the Building Thinkers stuff, it's just www.buildingthinkers.com. So Greg, thank you so much for helping me tell my story. And um, I look forward to staying connected and of course hearing all the amazing things that are going on in your world and I just really appreciate your friendship and your um, constant willingness to help others reflect and we'll we'll talk more later absolutely thanks so much for listening to the building thinkers podcast don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends and if you enjoyed what you heard please leave a podcast rating and review that helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms you can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.